Hi YouTube, welcome back, it's me again, Dave Lawton from Specialist Plastering, bringing you part two of my new exterior moulding series. This episode it will be about aggregates and binders and the differences between them, and, you know, explaining a little bit about the science. When we talk about aggregates, we normally, in this line of work, we're talking about, you know, the um, sand, the stone, and the powders and dust that we use to create the mortars that we either build with, that we use in between the blocks, or that we coat and shape buildings with to produce moulding. The relationship between the grain sizes and the layers in your, in your mouldings play a huge role. It's very, very important to understand that the large grains and the large particles have to be used in a base coat. The next coat can use smaller particles, smaller grain sizes, and the final coat can be even finer again. Um, this is because to, to allow for water to evaporate from a building, its natural passage will go from the, the large stone, the, the block that it's built with, transmit through into the large aggregates and the base coat that will then naturally draw out from the coat and be you know released back into the atmosphere as you work out from the the base of the building from the brickwork um, your layer size will always reduce so your first core coat your base layer maybe five millimeters of, of aggregate size um, your next layer will be reduced to 1.5 millimeters and you may find that a final layer be set down even further so you the only real exception to that rule of you know your smaller particle size would be shelter coats um, and I suppose you know wet or dry dash coats where a large aggregate is thrown as a top coat over the base coats this is done for a different reason this is done to poor weather areas and colder climates and it allows for more water to be absorbed into the out outside of the building allowed it to take a little bit more weather without any physical, you know, any signs of damage occurring. There will be cracks, there will be water penetration getting in, but the stones help to absorb some of that and build up a little bit of a stronger barrier uh, in real harsh conditions. These large stones that are used or the, in, wet, in dry dash or in wet dash, they'll absorb some of that. So that's the only real time when you'd, you'd go against the theory of, of you know, reducing your grain size as you get to the finer coats. For the top coats and the finished coats on this particular project, on most of our projects, we use a, f a fine local washed river sand. It's a sharp sand, probably been dredged from the Mersey to be fair, local to us, but it would have been the same sand that would have been used. It has to be washed, has to be salt free. We put this through a sieve. We didn't use sand directly from a, a builder's merchant. You wouldn't use sand directly from a sand supplier. It's your responsibility to sieve the sand Make sure it's ready for you, make sure you've got everything. Um, any of the sharp, heavy, or glass or other pieces of stone that we found, we still reuse them. I mean, you're building out some parts, some of the cores, you're building out 10, 20, 30 mil, so you're not getting any waste from it. If you're running a profile or if you're building up a base coat, you need to know that your material has been sieved. Our sand that we use is a nice silver color whether it's used with lime or, or cement, it produces a gray or a relatively pleasing finish color. If we wanted to change the color or the, the, the finish of a sand, we may sometimes uh, add a, a softer sand to it. Um, you know, soft building sand, while it, it shouldn't be used for plastering, it shouldn't be used for exterior um, moldings, it, the grain size is far too small. And the fact that the particles are round, it's too, too prone to cracking. Although you, you do find in plastering sand and being q and places like that, it's a blend of sharp sand mixed with soft, soft building sand. And that helps to reduce the cracking by filling in some of the voids because the sharp sand has had all its fines taken out of it. But soft building sand as well, because it comes from a, a pit, it's pit sand, it tends to contain a lot of clay. You don't want any clay really on an exterior project. You don't want anything that's you know, biodegradable a washed grit sand which is like a flooring sand for our base coats. Sometimes you need something a bit heavier, sometimes you're building up or you're dubbing out thicker areas. That will in in increase the grain size within your mix and that will allow you to do thicker coatings and stronger coatings um, without having to add, add more binder. It's one way of adding strength, a different look to a mix. 
You need to have good variation in your grain sizes and with your aggregates. You need to have, you know, large, small and really fine particle sizes so that when they're all mixed well together with a binder and with water, there's a good variation between the sizes. If you imagine a sandcastle, it's a good way to visualise the way a mortar acts. Sand particles, when you're building a sandcastle, are held together by the moisture that in the sand. You can't build a sandcastle out of dry sand. And if the sand's too wet, it'll fall apart. The way a binder works in a mortar, it's normally a hydrated dry powder, which when it's mixed with the water, it obviously hydrates, and it then flows around the particles. If you were to add a binder, to a sandcastle, you'd be left with a very strong sandcastle. So that's the kind of theory behind it, that the binder floats in the water, and when the water is absorbed by the chemical reaction, or the water is evaporated through um, evaporation, you're left with the binder still there as the water's left, and the binder is now left in a back into an, a dry state, combined with the particles. So when the water that is um, allowing the mixture to flow and to be become kind of, you know, plastic, where you get the word plaster from, when the plasticity is left and the material is either dried but the water is left through either it's evaporated or it's been absorbed in the chemical reaction, what you're left with is the matrix of the um, small and the large aggregates held together with the um, binder surrounding each of the grains or the um, aggregate pieces. The three types of binders that we use for our mouldings are split into categories of cements, limes and acrylic binders. And the properties of lime as a binder, they allow for the release and the regrowing basically of the, of the bond between the substrates, which allows for movement it allows for the particles to move over time and to absorb, as opposed to cement, where the chemical bond between the binder of cement and its aggregates is very, very strong and it's very permanent. It bonds the, the aggregates directly together with pretty much zero room for movement of you know, water or moisture. This can be beneficial, cement used in the right terms, used for the right purposes. They're the qualities you want. You need to cement things together. You need things to be joined. You wouldn't want concrete that was particularly flexible. So, um, you know, if you want hard, really rigid performance, you'd use cement. If you want to keep water out or, you know, keep water in, another time you'd use cement. Whereas lime, with its looser bond, its looser binding properties, and it's you know, rehealing properties, it's slower cure, it's lime, a better choice. I hope you've enjoyed that boring little thing about sand and aggregates and stuff, but very vital. And our next exciting series to look out for will be on mixing and mix design. That's right. Don't forget to check out our other videos in this series, as well as some new stuff coming out.